let's just get my presentation up. Great. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening for this uh, talk about the slow ways. I hope that you'll find it um, interesting, inspiring, questionable, maybe. I hope you'll have questions for me. Um, and I really look forward to hearing about the sort of thoughts you might have through the breakout sessions. Um, before I dive into this and describing a couple of other projects, I just wanted to say up front that, that Slow Ways has been an incredibly collaborative process with hundreds of people from across Great Britain being involved um, over the last uh, couple of months, some of whom have been spending, I think, probably the majority of their isolation hours um, on this project, which has been absolutely amazing to work on. So while I'm be talking about this, um, it's something that I've started is very much so, I think, a cultural offering to the UK, um, and I hope that you might choose to, to get involved. Before I but before I dive into Slow Ways and explain what that's all about, I just wanted to to tell you about a couple of other projects I've worked on previously, maybe as a bit of an insight into, in, into my brain. So um, um, as described, I'm a guerrilla geographer. Guerrilla geography is radical, alternative, creative, surprising geography, uh, extraordinary geographies that you may not um, expect to see in one way or another. And these sort of couple of projects maybe are examples of that. So firstly, about seven years ago now, I was very privileged to, to do a project where I did 127 micro adventures across the United Kingdom with my son. And we visited all of the UK's inspiring, distinctive, remarkable, beautiful national parks in a really condensed period of time. I, I spent my childhood visiting lots of national parks, but going on this journey, I began to really wonder um, about our national parks and got thinking about the fact that when you look at national parks around the world, they represent every single major type of internationally recognized uh, landscape and habitat that we can think of um, apart from um, the world's fastest growing um, habitat um, urban areas and that just sort of confused me a little bit because i don't think that urban life is worth anything less than rural life i don't think that urban peregrine falcons or urban foxes are worth less than those in the countryside and when you look at a landscape like this one london where i live we share this landscape with about 15,000 other species um, of wildlife. If, if people are wild, uh, we can have a discussion about that. Um, and we live in a habitat that we co-create with the rest of nature in this landscape. And so it kind of confused me why it was that major urban areas weren't included within the family of national parks around the world. So I asked this question, what if we made London a national park city? Seven years later, the London National Park City was launched last year. Fundamentally, it's about taking inspiration from what works about that brilliant idea of national parks in rural areas and says, well, how can we make that work for an urban environment as well? Fundamentally, it's about making the city greener, healthier, wilder, getting more people outdoors more of the time. Um, and I could you know, talk for a very long period about that project, but you can visit the London National Park City website. And we currently have an initiative on through the National Park City Foundation, for there to be 25 national park cities around the world by 2025. I think that Adelaide in Australia might be the second, or maybe Glasgow might just be them to it. Uh, there's a very young campaign in Glasgow. And then about two, three years ago, I started a project with um, Friends of the Earth. Um, I'm a former geography teacher. I've walked around and explored the UK extensively. And I began to realize the fact that although I had walked and traveled around the UK a lot, that I had no idea what it really looks like. I had no real sense of proportion. And I didn't really have a sense of proportion, I realized, just because it's really big. Like it's pretty hard to get a sense of your own sort of body distortions and what your own body looks like, let alone like an entire island as, as large as ours. And so I got thinking that, well, if, if I've got a geography degree and I'm a geographer and I've traveled around the UK a lot, if I've realized that I don't know what Britain looks like, then, then maybe other people don't too. And I began to get quite hung up about this issue that, you know, so much of the right wing tabloid media will say that Britain's full. You know, there's Britain's full. There's no space for refugees. There's no space for migrants. There's no space for affordable housing. There's no space for beavers, whatever it might be. And in the US, like President Trump um, very recently, about a year ago, was saying America, you know, the system's full. And he was talking about not having more migrants coming in over his wall from Mexico. The system's full. And then he went further and eventually he said, you know, that America's physically full, you know, it's, it's, it's full. And if anyone's been anywhere near America before, I think we all know that maybe it's not quite full. Um, and so I got thinking about that and uh, thinking about the mapping we have available to us. This is actually Corrine um, mapping of land cover across Great Britain. And how when we look at mapping like this, again, the picture is too complicated for our brains to make sense of. 
And if we break this kind of data down into a table or a chart or a pie chart, it becomes even more sterile than the image we're looking at on, on the right there. So we got thinking about that, reached out to Friends of the Earth, we ran a poll and found that one in three people think that over half of Britain is built on, um, which is, you know, um, not quite right. So I got together with them and we made a film that you can see on my Twitter feed if you search the hashtag UK in 100 seconds, where every second of the film is 1% of what Britain looks like from the air using land cover data. Um, and here's some images from that film. And what you discover is that over half the land is basically used for animal related agriculture in one way or another. Um, and about five, five to 7% of the land is, is buildings. But hopefully you'll find that, that film interesting. So I'm interested as a geographer in how we think about places and how sometimes the ideas we have about places are a bit twisted or confused or maybe we're not quite filling gaps and how we might be able to use geography and geographical thinking to join things up better and to find solutions. So slow ways. Also on my trekking um, around uh, the UK, um, I've done a lot of looking at the way in which we use maps and the way in which we inspire ourselves and others to travel around the country. And I think to some level, we've kind of forgotten something very beautiful about the, the deep heritage and beauty that we have within the 200,000 kilometers or so of public rights of way that we have in Great Britain, and obviously far more access in, in, in Scotland specifically. And I got thinking about the different kinds of ways in which we show information and share information. And I think maybe some of the most sort of famous paths we have in Britain are, are the national trails, right? These long distance routes like Offers Dyke, Pennine Way. But thinking about these routes, for the most part, they kind of go from rural places to rural places through rural places. The New England closed path isn't quite like that, but for the most part, that's what they do. And I think that they are quite often beautiful and exciting and, and rich with heritage and, you know, incredible places to explore but they can also be intimidating and challenging and technically difficult. And even just the simple thing of making sure that you can book places along the way can be difficult um, as well. So I think they're amazing, but they also have uh, the limitations. And then we have the National Cycle Network, which begins to make sense of the sort of uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers of, of public rights of ways and footpath we have. But clearly this is designed primarily for cyclists and it's primarily on road, so it's not really uh, for, for, for walkers. And then this here is uh, the Long Distance Walkers Association website. And I've just done a quick search. If you're not, not checked them out before, you should, they're really cool. If you search their website, you can say a particular place and then it'll tell you all the different footpaths that go off in, in different directions. And here I've created a little GIF that shows uh, some footpaths going out of the Southeast of Britain. And a few things strike me with this. One is that it's a bit of a chaotic mess, really. It's a bit like, spaghetti on a plate in terms of organization but as well as that there's like an elusiveness to what the paths actually do i mean if you are kind of a historian person who's into this kind of stuff then the writer's way or the pilgrim's way might mean something to you but for the average person in salisbury or winchester um, they're not going to necessarily know what those things are at all and actually it was a walk between winchester and salisbury that kind of inspired me to start thinking about why is it that we've forgotten that the origins of why we have footpaths in this country is to get between neighboring settlements you know we had those footpaths so you could walk to your neighboring settlement so you could trade meet family friends have a pint do some work and maybe you'll go on to the next settlement or the next settlements and go on a, a pilgrimage or just go and do that for a laugh whatever whatever your reasons are but it's almost like the way in which we're currently thinking about long distance footpath infrastructure and recreational walking in the country it's just slightly out of kilter it's almost like we start in the countryside we might accidentally go through a town or village and then we finish in the countryside rather than just connecting up the places where the transport hubs are and crucially where people live and where people are most likely to want to go and i think another good example of that is this here this this is os's map that they put out um every year or so of where the most routes have been made in in the country um and i must say that slow ways os have been a fantastic collaborator on the project and so what this does is, and this often goes into the, the news, is it gives the illusion that the most activity in terms of outdoor recreation is happening in the national parks and in the countryside. And yes, brilliant places, fantastic places, and there's a lot going on there. I'm not saying that's not the case. But when we look at the Strava maps to show where most people are walking and running through GPS trails, we see that it's mostly actually the activity in cities where in reality people are actually doing things. So I got thinking about 
the primary destinations we have in this country that both the Department for Transport map out and also Ordnance Survey map out on their maps. And they create these primary destinations based on populations of people, uh, cultural places of cultural importance, transport importance, and then they're slightly bent and skewed as well um, because of uh, differences in populations around the country. And I got thinking about like the really old mapping that we have from around the world, where people used to sail across oceans and create these sort of straight lines connecting places. And just started to play around with this idea of there being this geometric network that could cartographically be more appealing to the eye in terms of imagining how we might get around the country. Um, for, and starting to create these interesting sort of triangular uh, patterns as well, which the, the country kind of naturally brings out to you because of the way that the settlements have formed and their distribution apart from one another. And there's two sort of thoughtful, playful ideas that came off this for me. What the first one, which is just playful and maybe a bit silly, and the second one, which is what I like most about this project. And the idea that maybe someone might choose to go on a triangular walk, where on a Friday night they finish work, they get a train somewhere, they walk to a neighbouring settlement, which might be 10 or 20 kilometres away, they then have, have a meal somewhere, and then the next day, and stay there the night, the next day they go to the next settlement, and then on the Sunday they return back again. So you can imagine these kind of triangular routes. And what's, what, what I think is really great about this is it opens up the inclusivity and accessibility of the potential to go on longer walks. What I mean by that is that a lot of the national trails and strategic footpaths that go through a beautiful rural Britain, quite often there aren't necessarily that many pubs around or hotels around. And so your choice is quite limited, which means that prices can be quite high to make those journeys. But if you could sofa surf, if you could stay in an Airbnb, if you could stay in a travel lodge, if you could eat at Tesco, then it opens up opportunities for more people maybe to engage with this kind of walking. So we're walking through beautiful countryside and amazing places, but then staying each night where people historically would have stayed in large villages, towns, and cities. But what excites me most about this project um, is thinking more about how you could combine multiple slow ways to think about making long distance journeys across the country. In this case, imagining going from Swansea over uh, to Norwich, I think it is, or Great Yarmouth or somewhere, I can't see because the, the, your faces are all hiding the other end of the map. But you can imagine doing these segments of 10, 20 kilometers um, and combining them together for these long distance walks. So a slow way, is really this principle that we should be able to walk between neighbouring settlements and to be honest if you can't walk safely and directly between two neighbouring settlements then I think the local parish council and the council should be onto that because with Covid and climate change and everything there's something going wrong if you can't make that journey. So after a lot more work working with a core group of about 10 volunteers after a hack day we put together this um, map, um, this is for the north of England, and come up with an overview map connecting up different settlements, connecting up 2,500 places of the highest population, but also places of cultural importance for different parts of the country as well. So that's all the towns and cities, all the largest villages, and then some other important places as well. And so this is just an idea of how you could have a, a, a slow ways to to Birmingham from London rather than a high, 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 high speed to maybe. So on the ground, they look a bit more like this. This is an audience survey map showing us just using consumer facing OS maps to create these routes. And then uh, volunteers were working together in their hundreds just using Excel spreadsheets, Google, uh, Google forms to upload and share uh, these routes as they went. So a slow way then, just to dig into this a little bit more, a slow way then is this principle that you should be able to walk between two neighbouring settlements. So for example, between Salisbury and Winchester. But there's two key concepts that I'd like to share with you now that not a lot of people know about necessarily, but I think are really important. So firstly, while the slow way is the principle for getting between these two places, in reality, there may be um, two or three or four different options for getting between those places. And the reason for that is this idea of what we're calling doability, right? So when we call it doability, because doability is different from accessibility, because doability is saying, well, what do you bring to the party as well as what does the landscape offer you, right? So, um, some people, for example, may not want to walk down a canal going through a city. Some people might not want to walk over a mountain pass. Some people might need to avoid uh, kissing gates. And so we can have different route options for different types of people depending on their needs. Equally, when combining journeys over a long distance, we might be able to say, oh, you, know, you don't want to walk more than 10 or 15 kilometers a day. So this is the best combination of routes to make that journey. But as well as that, this means that this principle is backwards compatible to other routes that already exist. Because for example, the Pilgrim's Way, which also connects Salisbury and Winchester, can fit into this as a route option for making that journey. 
But as well as that, and this is the bit that makes the project really complicated, but is really cool as well, is that, um, that we're not really trying to get a single route to get between two places, right? That's not necessarily the aim, which makes it harder for mapping and signage and all that kind of stuff. But we've got this idea, I've got this idea in my head, and I'm sure you will all appreciate this, of there being almost like an ecological succession of routes. So in the first phase of the project, we've created the pioneer routes, and those first routes may or may not be the best routes, but rather than politically renegotiating the angles and, and places that the routes go to, instead it's about iterating so that other people can suggest better routes in the future, and then by voting on them and rating them, we can then surface the best routes and find almost like a climax community of the most direct, most healthy, easiest routes to take. And those are the maps, maybe in some distant time, and we can think about becoming more like permanently established, if that makes sense. So when volunteers were working on slow ways, and I'll just whiz through these, we used a set of uh, a methodology for thinking about how the route should be designed. But they need to start and finish at a good central point, like a train station or a bus station. Be direct. They're called slow ways, but that doesn't mean they need to zigzag all around the place. Be off-road, be safe and accessible, have resting points every five to ten kilometres where possible. Not possible uh, in parts of Scotland um, very much. But basically they were looking at looking for pubs on OS maps as an, an indicator of a good place but there's likely to be somewhere where you can stop and sleep and have a pint and that kind of stuff. That they should pass through transport hubs where possible, they should be enjoyable and beautiful and where possible used established routes. But a really clear instruction was that number seven and eight were the least important, okay? So it's far more important that the route is direct and accessible and off-road than it is that it's beautiful because there are plenty of people out there telling us routes that are beautiful, right? And there's nothing stopping people from making a slow way more beautiful if they want to, and many of them will be beautiful anyway, but primarily this is about connecting places, so the directness is important. So in reality, the network looks a bit like this, it's all wiggly, and this is just a, an illustration of this journey from Swansea over to um, um, Norwich, to show you the example of how, on this particular journey, it, there may be, a best way but there might also be multiple best ways depending on your needs um, which I think is really cool. So phase one was about creating a first draft and a provocation. 7,500 routes, what do you think everybody? Um, we had 700 volunteers volunteer during lockdown, create 7,500 routes that stretch for 120,000 kilometres which is the equivalent of 2.5 laps of the equator all in about a month. I mean we spent about another month preparing for that and another month uh, currently dealing with a snagging list of hundreds of problems to deal with but basically it was a month of work which is awesome. The next phase is to go and explore the routes, test them and to make sure that they all work. So what I'm hoping we'll achieve by this autumn is to have set up a website that can handle lots of people volunteering and feeding back and creating new routes and I hope to uh, recruit 10,000 volunteers from across Great Britain to walk routes from anywhere between five kilometres and 60 kilometres. The average one is 15 Thousands are under 10 kilometres, but in Scotland, there's some really gnarly ones uh, to contend with. So 10,000 volunteers, and it'd be wonderful if any of you wanted to help um, either test routes or help to get them established on the ground in one way or another. Thank you very much.